Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Welcome to our program today entitled Key Trademark and Copyright Developments Around the World, Implications for Nonprofits in China, Europe, Cuba, and Beyond. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum, Chair of the Nonprofit Organizations Practice here at the Venable Law Firm. Um, and for those of you who are not aware, this program is part of the monthly series that we do every month on a variety of uh, different nonprofit legal topics. Here in our DC office, for those of you who are able to join us for lunch and come to our offices, and then we have a great group of about 200 folks today around the country on the webinar portion of today's program. Um, and as many of you know, all of these programs are recorded. Uh, we keep them all on a YouTube channel uh, for your viewing and listening pleasure at some later dates. Tomorrow everyone will get an email that contains a link to the recording of today's program. Feel free to, feel free to share that with colleagues and others uh, who may benefit from that. Uh, a few housekeeping tips before we get into the uh, substance of today's program. For those of you in the Trade and Professional Association community, uh, these programs are eligible for CAE Continuing Education Credit uh, for those who are CAE certified. A preview of our next three scheduled upcoming programs. We actually have December scheduled as well, uh, but that's not posted yet. Uh, first on September 20th, uh, our program is entitled How to Protect Nonprofits Fed Federally Funded Programs with Global Anti-Corruption Controls. A very hot topic for those of you who work uh, in the international space, and this program is co-sponsored with Inside NGO, who's been a great partner of ours and co-sponsoring a number of programs over the last few years. On October 13th, our program is entitled How Your Nonprofit Can Operate a Legally Sound Certification or Accreditation Program. And on November 10th, our program is entitled Federal and state regulators and watchdog groups are bearing down on charities and their professional fundraisers how to prepare for the regulatory storm. We have some uh, terrific and exciting and diverse programs coming up. We hope you'll join us uh, for those. Uh, in terms of uh, today's program, those of you in the room have a handout booklet in front of you that has a printed copy of the slides, the PowerPoint slides for today's program along with full bios of our speakers and handout materials. There's some terrific articles in there. Uh, some of these programs we're, we're fortunate to have some really great articles to include as additional handout materials, some less so, but this one is one where there's some really uh, valuable articles that, that expand upon and expand upon the issues that we're going to be talking about here today. So I would um, point those to your attention. Those of you on the webinar, I did receive a link to the PowerPoint slides, and tomorrow when you get that follow-up email, it will contain a link to all of the handout materials as well. And like I said, feel free to share that with others who might benefit from it. In terms of questions, uh, for those of you in the room uh, and for all of you, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the program. Um, it is uh, mid-August and we uh, are grateful that you're out here and joining us uh, for our program in mid-August in D.C. Uh, so the least we can do is make sure we answer all your questions. So feel free throughout the program, just raise your hand. All we ask is that you wait for the microphone to come to you so everyone on the phone uh, can hear your questions. <clears throat> those of you in the webinar, pose your questions to me using the chat feature on the uh, webinar software, and I will pose those to our speakers. And speaking of our speakers, uh, we have two of my colleagues today who I'm very, very pleased uh, were uh, able and willing to, uh, to join us for this program. To my immediate right is Andrew Price. Andrew is a veteran of a number of these programs that we've done over the last six years. Uh, Andrew is also a veteran here with me at Venable. He started here about 18 years ago, and I started here 17 years ago. So we've, and we have worked together ever since very closely. Uh, Andrew is uh, the best trademark lawyer that I've ever come across in my career. Uh, he works with literally hundreds and hundreds of our nonprofit and association clients every year in helping to protect their trademarks and their brand uh, protection, licensing, enforcement, both domestically and ever increasingly around the globe, which is obviously the focus of today's program. Uh, he's an absolutely first-rate lawyer with a lot of great practical insights and experience and wisdom that he's going to share with you here today. <clears throat> so thank you, Andrew, for joining us. And then to Andrew's right is, uh, is my colleague, our colleague Justin Pierce. Um, uh, Justin is a terrific intellectual property lawyer that works in, in an even broader area of IP, uh, trademarks, copyrights, and patents. Uh, so his, his practice covers uh, patent litigation, trademarks and brand protection, anti-counterfeiting, copyrights, design rights, trade secrets, and more. 
Uh, Justin and I worked together a number of years ago, and then he left to go in-house at Sony Mobile, where he was for uh, a number of years, and then came back a few years ago to join us, uh, rejoin us here at the firm. Um, he also uh, uh, co-chairs uh, Venable's uh, technology division, who's taken a, a very important leadership role uh, here in the firm. Uh, Justin has great experience in all of these issues. He's going to focus more on the copyright side of the house today. Justin does a lot of work in the international space uh, when it comes to a whole wide variety of IT issues, including copyright, and you will absolutely benefit from his wisdom today. And Justin, thank you. He, had to go through all sorts of hoops to reschedule a closing of a house in North Carolina and to get on a plane and make sure he got back here. He was giving me a heart attack the other day when he thought he wasn't going to be able to make it. But thank you for making it, Justin. I appreciate it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew to get us started. Andrew. Well, I want to thank uh, everybody for joining us in person and, and on the webinar. Um, I see a lot of new faces here in, in person, and, and I know there are a lot of uh, some, some uh, new faces and, and, and old names here. Um, people I know in the room, but on the, the webinar I know there are a number of uh, good friends and long-standing clients, so I want to welcome everybody uh, to the webinar as well. Um, before I get started into the substance of uh, the trademark aspect of things, I want to kind of set out how we're going to do this. Um, Justin and I will talk together about uh, the trademark aspects of uh, and trademark developments on the international front, and Justin will take uh, more of the lead on the copyright side and probably cover most of that subject. There are probably more developments and more to say on the trademark side, and so you'll see that it's weighted intentionally in that direction. Um, and I'd also like to say, just by way of background, for those who, of you who don't know me, I've been working with Justin uh, and Jeff uh, on, uh, for almost a, a daily basis for with Justin uh, about a decade and, and with Jeff uh, for, for years before that. So. Um, we have a lot of kind of personal war stories to tell, and, uh, and we look forward to taking your questions as well as we go. Um, so why don't we lead if, uh, let's see, do this, there we go, okay. So I'd like to lead with this quote, um, as I do often when I speak to a nonprofit audience. And I love this quote from Marcy Marsh, uh, the COO of the World Wildlife Fund, our brand is the single greatest asset that our network has. Um, I would only make one change to that quote, and that is to make the word brand plural, um, because as you know, everybody in the room and on the webinar, you have um, kind of what you might call your house brand or brands, which is what you see in the upper left-hand corner of your website. Um, but you also have um, in the nonprofit world usually a lot of credentials. You're going to have uh, oftentimes supporting brands that are very important to you um, and, and really essential and, and your, among your greatest assets. So I challenge everybody as you start to think about trademarks um, to, to understand that trademarks is really another word for brand and to think about what assets you might have in your organization that would be more important than a brand. Um, I think in almost all cases you'll come up with the same answer as Marcy, uh, Marcy did here. So I, I created this ladder a few years ago to demonstrate um, how we see brand value uh, working in both the for-profit and nonprofit space. You know, whether you're a nonprofit or, or for-profit, you always have some value um, that uh, is in your brand, and that's in the form of goodwill, uh, is the legal term for it, and. And it's also in the form of, of things like you know, how, how your uh, organization is growing um, and, and what people think about it. The reputation is part of the goodwill. So how do you get to brand value? Well, everybody wants the easy way. And so the easy way is just to say, okay, well, we have a brand and we have an organization, and so we have value. Um, but of course, that's missing a lot of the um, analysis and the steps that are required to take uh, something that starts as a brand and really turn it into something that's of value. And so if you look at the bottom in red, you'll see brand distinctiveness, availability, and exclusivity. So this is a step that, that many nonprofits often uh, don't even get, get to or get beyond. And so what I mean by brand distinctiveness is that in the trademark world, to have uh, a brand that can be, can be protected, you have to have something that is either what's called inherently distinctive, um, 
or has acquired distinctiveness by virtue of use of that brand over time. And so in the nonprofit world, the acronyms that you have will generally start out as inherently distinctive, which is great. The full names that you often have for your organization will often start out as what's called descriptive and not immediately capable of legal protection, but capable of acquiring distinctiveness over time. So you're going to get to that uh, level of distinctiveness hopefully one way or another. Um, and hopefully satisfied. Another part of it is going to be whether that brand is even available. You know, every week or so we get a call from a nonprofit who is engaged in a rebranding, and the rebranding will uh, allow us to focus on whether the brand that's desired for adoption um, is available, whether there are third parties who have registered rights in it already or what are called common law rights based on use of that brand. And so that availability is key. But kind of part and parcel of that is whether you could have exclusive rights in that acronym uh, or full name, not just fitting in, is it available, are there legal arguments to help you fit in, but can you really own it exclusively and carve out a big zone of rights. And so if you can do all these things, what it usually means is that you've engaged a trademark lawyer uh, to study the availability, the exclusivity, to study the distinctiveness and make sure um, that you have an understanding of where your brand falls uh, kind of on that spectrum. Um, and, and the next level up, of course, once you do that, is to register it. And this is a level that often um, you know, many of our clients on the webinar and, and in person know well. Um, and others think that, well, maybe I do or don't need the registration. Um, but the registration is always going to be your kind of Exhibit A in a dispute. We'll talk more about that. Um, and it's necessary to give you a presumption of rights in most countries. And I should say that on each of these levels, you're going to be dealing with these uh, factors on a country-by-country -country basis. So just doing it in the U.S. is not enough if you have interests and activities outside of the U.S., whether that be Canada or Europe or other countries. So the registration is one piece. And then there's control, which is usually in the form of licensing. Do you allow other parties to use your brand? How do you control that use? Do you have a written license? And it's this layer really where we see most nonprofits fail and where we get a lot of our dispute work, a lot of the um, you know, kind of good for venable, bad for the nonprofit, very lucrative ex uh, dis dispute work. And so the way to avoid all of that is to make sure that you do proactive advance work at the uh, brand registration and control level. Um, so you combine all these things together, a brand that's distinctive, available, exclusive, and re registered and controlled through licensing, and that helps create brand strength. And the way to really develop that brand strength is through enforcement, and Justin will add points as we go. Um, but you combine all that with kind of the performance of your nonprofit in the marketplace and the role of each brand, whether it's a house mark or a sub mark, um, and all that together will create this brand value. So it's very important to think about the levels that it takes to get to that brand value. Anything to add on that, Justin? Yeah, I think this ladder he's created here is it's really visual, and I think it really serves the message of how you kind of go through this foundational process. But at the same time, it's really an art form as well in terms of how do you get to that pinnacle of brand value or the highest level of brand value for your nonprofit organization. And the only other thing I would add there is that to get to that point, it's not so much a science as an art form. And he talked about how if you're going through this ladder, you're talking to a trademark attorney, you're considering a lot of different variables and factors. And as many years as we've dealt with this and addressed this, I've always said that this is sort of a trap for the unwary when you get into what does it take to have strong trademarks or what does it take to consider all the risks that your organization may face, let's say when you're going through a rebranding. And this really is, if you think about the steps that are talked about in this ladder, something where at some point not only do you have to consult with your trademark attorney, but also be in alignment with the board or your management, senior management of your organization, to kind of go through this in a really step-by-step -step fashion to get to the right answer or risk management uh, as, you, as you may need. Yeah. So the basics never change here is the theme. We're going to talk a lot about developments today uh, in the law around the world, but these basics are always going to be there. So moving on, um, 
you know, I've, I think I've already said this, the registration is king uh, as a mode of protection. Trademarks must be protected on a country by country basis. Um, a point I did not mention earlier is that many countries around the world employ what's called a first to file model. And this is different than what we see in the U.S. So in the United States, you can have trademark rights based on uh, either your use of a brand or through this registration process that many of you know. Um, and so what you have there in the U.S. is a fallback or kind of a little bit of a safety that if worse comes to worse and you don't have a registration where you, you may be able to salvage some rights by virtue of this common law protection. It's very expensive usually, by the way, and tough to prove uh, the nationwide rights that you're going to need in most disputes. Um, and, and what we'll typically find in the nonprofit world when we're trying to prove common law rights is that the people who know about the history may not be there anymore. The documents that would prove the history don't exist anymore. So your ability to really rely on uh, common law rights is comp uh, compromised. So, What's the standard in trademark law? Again, this is one of the basics that never changes, and that is likelihood of confusion. Um, we have Damon Wright in the audience, for example. If you go to him on a trademark litigation, um, he's going to work through the likelihood of confusion factors to try to assess your case and then argue your case. And so likelihood of confusion, I always tell people, is the lowest standard uh, known to the law. Everybody knows beyond a reasonable doubt. That's where everybody can agree. And that's a really high standard. In the trademark world, uh, likelihood of confusion is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, if you have a trademark litigation, you're often going to need a survey expert. That expert is a very highly paid uh, person who's going to go um, either on the Internet or in a shopping mall, basically try to get consumer reactions uh, as to whether they may be confused. If that survey generates a confusion rate of say 20 to 25 percent or maybe one out of five people, that, then you win as the plaintiff. And so you can see it's the opposite from beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not a good place to be as a defendant. It's a good place to be when you're the trademark owner. Andrew, just two things to interject before you move on. Uh, first off, we're, we're of course, when Andrew is talking about registration in the U.S., he's talking about referring to federal trademark registration with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, for those of you who may come from, from state associations or state chapters of nonprofit organizations where you're only operating in one state, um, every state does have its own state trademark registration regime. Uh, most of the folks participating in this program, though, are from national organizations, so it's not something um, uh, of, of particular interest. Um, so when we're talking about federal registration in the U.S., we're talking about the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And of course, it goes without saying, but the likelihood of confusion standard means that we're not, for, for something to, uh, for one mark to infringe someone else's mark, it doesn't necessarily have to be identical. Um, and it could be far less than that. And as Justin will talk about on the copyright side, you know, the, the, the doctrine of what's confusingly similar in the copyright side, uh, same thing. It doesn't have to be an exact replica to, to create trademark infringement. And that's why. Uh, this area can be particularly risky in terms of infringement and particularly dangerous if you're not fully protecting your own trademark rights. Yeah, it's an excellent point. Uh, many kind of people who are new to trademarks will say, well, I'll just go to the USPTO database. I've plugged in the exact name. Why do I need a trademark lawyer? This is all so simple. Um, and so it's really in this, when you're applying this likelihood of confusion test, you're looking at the similarity of the trademarks the similarity of the party's goods and services and, and a number of other factors, but those tend to be uh, very important. And, and uh, it's not, it's, it is an art, as Justin said, more than a science. Justin, any comments on it? Well, the only thing I'd offer here, um, just because I see how we're talking about the standard being low, and I know the next bullet has to do with cost. And so he earlier was talking about you know, the registration step or the cost of a federal registration. Although that is costly for many organizations, if you think about that cost in the context of where this kind of litigation can go, if someone disputes, let's say, the new rebrand for your organization or for your nonprofit, I just want to share a couple of statistics with you to kind of put this in context. So according to the AIPLA, American Intellectual Property Law Association, for, let's say, a hard-fought trademark dispute, we've used that term here today, between two medium-sized companies, on average, and they're including all types of organizations in these statistics, there's 
on the median, they say somewhere between $500,000 to $700,000 is spent. So if you think about that, for companies or organizations who are not even sort of the big ones that you hear about day to day to spend that much in an average trademark dispute gives you an idea just how valuable it is to think through some of the steps that have been talked about at that early registration step. Yeah, and, and even uh, trademark registration, unlike copyright registration, is a lot more complex. It is more expensive. You do typically need to work with, with, with an attorney who's, who's an expert in the area, whereas copyright registrations are, are very easy and simple and with a little initial guidance and direction you can do it yourself without counsel and the filing fees are much less. That being said, still when you compare it to the cost of litigation, and not just that, but when you think about what other rights are, are all grounded and rooted in and kind of flow from that federal trademark registration, including domain name disputes and so many other things and foreign registrations, uh, it's it, it's really to us it's a no brainer. And Andrew, what what would you what, what do we usually ballpark you know for a typical to say uh, a nonprofit's name or logo? And and we're, it gets a little complicated because you have protection and registration typically for the words, and then a separate one for the design. Like if you have a logo, but for a single registration, you know, and a, or a typical number of classes, what would we be, be looking at in terms of? legal fees and filing fees. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it almost gets laughable when you think about the cost of the dispute to compare that with the cost of an application. The government's going to charge you about $275 per class. Um, any trademark law firm around the country is, uh, you know, of substance is going to charge somewhere in the neighborhood of six to $700, so under $1,000 um, you can get an application on file. We tend to lump all goods and services into one class when we file, so we defer uh, those government fees until a later time, so you, you can expect to file an application under $1,000. So anytime we have one of these big expensive disputes, people always look back on that and just uh, bang, start banging their head against the wall. So with all that in mind, I, I will always uh, tell clients that uh, you have to consistently use your brand. You've got to register and license it uh, correctly, as I said earlier. But you should continually be going through an assessment of what are your key brands, uh, what are your key goods and services, and what are your key countries. And, and don't just do it once at the time of rebranding, um, but you're going to want to do it periodically as you're in expansion mode or contraction mode or as uh, business uh, uh, dynamics change. And it's not just your organization's name and logo. That's obviously the most important, and I'm still shocked sometimes when we take over as counsel for a new client, new and nonprofit, and they have some registrations, but alas, they're missing one for their actual name and logo, or the, the logo has changed, or the name has changed, and, and there was no new updated or, or new registration filed. But it's more than that. It's names of key programs, key publications, key events. Uh, if you have a certification or accreditation program, uh, there's a separate uh, classification for a certification mark that's often used um, for, for certification mark protection. Uh, and you have to think more broadly uh, for any of your key brands. And like Andrew said, as those evolve over time, you need to evolve your registration profile both in the U.S. and, and overseas. One thing that we see commonly is when we're inheriting um, you know, small nonprofit trademark portfolios is if they have the right trademark covered, they've got the wrong goods and services, and maybe they're 20 years out of date. And so um, there is a need to audit. Uh, what you own, and that helps guide uh, what you do. So the basics never change, and, and the registry is king. Um, now we're going to start talking about the thing that many of you came to hear about, but I see a, a question in the back, please. Please. Yeah, please. So I have a question when it comes to the whole descriptiveness of trademarks, distinctiveness and descriptiveness of trademarks. If you have a combination trademark that's part Logo, that has a logo and it does have some text features of it, but the text itself might be considered descriptive, yeah. is it best to file the mark as a whole with the logo and the text, or should you try to get the text through first? Yeah, so it will depend how integrated it is as to whether you can um, separate the two. If you can separate the two, you're going to want to do both separately. Um, and so what you're going to want to do when you have a descriptive uh, phrase is to register it on what's called the supplemental register, which is kind of a register that provides more limited rights. You can use the circle R. It reserves a place for you on the preferred principal register, um, but ultimately you're going to need to prove acquired distinctiveness, file a new application, and get on the principal register in, in order to have really complete trademark rights. 
if you think about it, the reason it's so important if they are separable to have separate registration, and whether it's the name of your organization or the name of a program, if you also have a design element that goes with it, some kind of logo, um, you want to have both because one is going to give you protection if someone else is copying that same basic design but perhaps not copying the same words. And then on the other side, if someone's copying, the, trying to play off of the words but, but not trying to copy the design, you really need to have the, the protection that comes with both. And, and Andrew just referenced something that's an important point. It is illegal to use that little R with a circle around it, the trademark notice, unless it is a federally registered trademark on either the supplemental or the principal uh, registry. If not, if you have other marks that are not registered, you should still use trademark notices, but it would be the little TM um, that you see sometimes next to trademarks. But once you get on, the, uh, on either of the uh, federal registries and you want to start using the R with a circle. Yeah. Excellent points. And all I would add to that is that one reason to register the separate elements of, of a logo uh, that has multiple elements is that one of those elements may change. You may decide, all right, we still like our name or our acronym or our design, but we're going to change one part of it. You don't want that registration to become obsolete. Um, the U.S. in particular has a really high bar when it comes to whether you can amend a registration from one form to another. Um, and the standard is material change, and it's very hard to meet that standard. So um, really for the low cost, it, it, there's no real reason why uh, you know, anything should be lumped together. So now moving on to the developments that you all wanted to hear about, uh, we're going to divide these into different regions. Um, with a lot of emphasis on uh, Europe and China, and touch on uh, developments in Cuba and Middle East and Canada. Um, but I think probably the, the development that everybody's concerned about in trademarks is what's going to happen to my EU trademark registration uh, in view of Brexit. And so the answer to that, uh, as, as the UK has decided to, to leave the, uh, the EU system, is like many legal answers, uh, we don't know for sure yet, uh, but we do know one thing for sure right now, which is for now it's business as usual, um, and no immediate change is going to occur probably for two years. Um, negotiations over the exit, as you probably heard in the news, are expected to take about that time. Um, and, and that just hasn't occurred yet. So the two-hour period, just that clock hasn't started ticking. So what, are we, you know, what should you do in the meantime, and, and what kind of transitional uh, provisions are expected? So the cautious approach uh, as we wait for all this to, to play out is that if the UK is an absolute key market and you've got a new brand or a rebranding happening, um, would be to file in both the UK uh, and at the EU level. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by EU in the trademark world, it's much the same as you would expect. You get to cover about 28 countries or so in one trademark application. It's the most cost-effective filing mechanism in the world. And so uh, and the UK is usually a very big and important country or part of that EU registration for most people. So, of course, everybody's concerned to know are they going to have to now file in, in, in two places instead of one? Is the cost going to double? Um, what protection will I have, if any, in the UK? And it's kind of like I see this as the reverse of when um, the EU, EU system was formed uh, more than 10 years ago. At that time, people really didn't know what the, quote, CTM or community trademark uh, registration would mean. And so the cautious approach at that time was to file both a community trademark application but also one in the UK. And so these days if you've got something that's a bet the company or bet the nonprofit, I should say, um, brand, you should file in both. And we do see clients uh, doing that. That's the exception, not the rule. Um, <clears throat> for most clients right now is a waiting period to um, enjoy the benefits of the EU registration, but be aware of this change that's coming and to think about how um, your rights may be affected um, after this two-year period um, ends. And how they may be affected is probably one of two things. One may be um, that there, there will be a period of conversion allowed where you could convert 
uh, part of your EU registration into a UK registration. We've done that recently for another client for a different reason um, where we wanted to convert the entire EU registration into a UK or application into a, a UK application and not claim uh, other countries. Um, that may be the solution. Um, it's also possible, of course, that there may be a, an agreement reached where the EU system continues to cover the UK for trademark law purposes. Um, so at, at the end of the day, whichever option occurs, we think it's very likely that you will be able to retain your priority filing date or your, your actual filing date for your underlying uh, EU registration. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by priority, um, the, the World Trademark System works in this way. If you file a trademark application in the U.S., for example, today, you have six months to file in a foreign country <clears throat> and, excuse me, and claim the right, uh, claim all rights from that early date of filing of today. And so that's a real benefit. And when you file that EU application, application, let's say a year or six months from now, that registration when it issues will give you EU-wide rights that date back to today. So my point here is it's, it's very likely that you'll be able to continue to retain the ability to claim that early priority date if you had one or a filing date. Justin, have I covered those points? Anything else? I think this is great. One, one thing I like about these type of seminars and the chance to talk about some of the international developments quite simply is this, whether it's Brexit or whatever the next big international legal or treaty change that faces, these are often the times that international organizations, um, nonprofits in particular, are faced with situations that you may not have ever thought could happen before. So it's always good to sort of keep track of what are the implications of these law changes and how would that impact you going forward. And I think he covered this brilliantly. Okay, so a few other developments in the EU system that are um, probably less significant um, on the material side of things, but still important to know about just in terms of the semantics. Um, there's been a name change, so for those of you who've dealt with EU trademarks, or you, you know that we've called them CTM uh, registrations, and you know that we've referred to the trademark office uh, not as the PTO, but as OHIM. And so that name, OHIM, is, uh, has changed um, to the EU IPO, and the, what used to be the CTM or community trademark is now the EU trademark. Um, so there is another kind of substantive change in the law that's important for nonprofits and others to think about. Um, there's a deadline coming up of September 23rd to deal with this issue. For any nonprofits who have an EU trademark registration that covers an entire class heading, um, you have a period of up until September 23rd to uh, make a change. And so there, that's the big picture. Let me give you some of the details. So if your mark was registered in the EU as a CTM uh, before June 22, 2012, and your registration has a class that covers um, the entire class heading, and what we mean by that is there's something called uh, the NICE classification system, and there's kind of a, a, a heading that's used, and you see at the bottom of this slide some examples of that. Um, if you use that kind of form class heading as opposed to very specific uh, description of your goods and services, you're, you're going to be eligible here. It, but the thing to think about is whether you actually intended to cover uh, less than, well, I don't, maybe less is the wrong word, you, you intended to cover something more specific than is covered by the class heading. So for example, if you look to the bottom of this, class 35 is advertising, business management, business administration, and office functions. So there's a lot more that's in class 35 that's not articulated in that class heading. Um, this change of the law occurred because the courts couldn't decide whether a registration that covered this class heading actually covered things that are not articulated there but are within the class. For example, if you have, if you're an association, 
Um, in the U.S., they accept the phrase association services as an acceptable ID. In the EU, they don't, so we would often use a phrase that has something to do with promoting uh, pr promotional activities, things of that nature. So that's not articulated here in class 35 in the class heading, but it is uh, within the class itself. And so the change of the law was to try to deal with this problem and bring clarity to it. So if, if you filed for the class heading in class 35, for example, and you intended to cover uh, these promotional type services uh, as an alternate to association services, you would want to go in and make that change. Uh, if you've worked through Venable, uh, in most cases you will not have a class heading to begin with because as a matter of strategy, um, we don't tend to adopt class headings except where the local country may require it and the EU never required it. Um, I, early in my practice, I made a choice that the class headings had a lot of stuff in it that many clients wouldn't need. For example, in class nine has, you know, jukeboxes or something. So um, if you, we found we were getting oppositions um, by other parties uh, based on rights in areas that our clients just didn't care about. And so pretty early on, we, we moved from just the easy way of covering the class heading to more of a U.S. style to cover um, the actual goods and services that a client cares about. But, but this is a factor for uh, a large number of uh, EU trademark holders. Uh, Justin and Jeff? Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a point here that probably should have made under the basics uh, part of this discussion, just to make sure it helped you understand what Andrew was just talking about. So trademark law, and this is where there's a lot of similarities between trademark and copyright law. There's also a lot of differences, and this is one of those differences. In trademark law, your rights, uh, it's not only the mark itself and what it looks like the visually, the words, et cetera, that matters, uh, but when Andrew's talking about what classes and what types of services you're registered for, he was talking earlier about how we find a lot of mistakes in that regard in, in, in federal trademark registrations, for instance, here in the U.S. Um, your rights are only, they only extend to whatever services are identified. Um, so for instance, if you have the same exact name of an organization, but one operates in one industry for certain types of product or service, and the other operates in another completely different industry, different products or services, and there's no significant likelihood of confusion amongst the general public as to the source of those products or services because they're in two completely different industries, then unless it's a really famous mark, like a brand that everyone would know, then generally speaking, those two marks can coexist. Uh, and even two federal registrations can sometimes coexist. It depends. But um, the, the point is how you define what services you're covering will have an impact not only on how broad your rights are, but also when you might be stepping over the line into someone else's rights and raise, when Andrews is in opposition, someone kind of challenging your registration, saying, no, you know, we don't want you to cross that line into our side. And that's why it's so critical to carefully, not too narrowly and not too broadly, define what services your mark is intended to cover. One good example of that kind of coexistence that we all uh, uh, know of but maybe don't think about, think of Delta. You have Delta Airlines, famous for airline services, but you also have Delta for faucets and toiletry accessories. Both of them well-known companies. Their trademarks are very strong and powerful, but each of them cover an entirely set of separate goods and services. So this is uh, an area that a lot of uh, even trademark lawyers, but clients especially, will gloss over and they'll say, well, just cover whatever goods and services. It's, it's all fine. We don't care about that. We just want the brand. I think what they're both saying is that um, what the goods and services are that are articulated in a registration are really, um, that's where it's at. So, you know, everybody can identify what your brand is, but a lot of the hard work is how do you identify very carefully, again, not too broadly, not too narrowly, what your goods and services are. It becomes a more significant issue in other countries like China, and we'll talk about China uh, on some other points, but China has a local classification system. And so if you have any goods or services that fall in a particular local class and another party has uh, a trademark for something that's confusingly similar in that local class, it doesn't matter if they're really distinguishable goods in some way or services, uh, the trademark office won't let you coexist. And if you have, say, um, 
you know, if you have a bunch of different goods and services, you cover the whole landscape in a, in a Chinese filing and you generate a lot of these refusals based on the subclasses, um, it can just be expensive and problematic and slow, slow you down and ultimately result in, all, in many cases of not even getting a registration. And one last little corollary point. As many nonprofits, their services evolve over time. You get into new areas. You develop new programs, new product lines, other things that extend kind of far beyond what you were doing originally, either through your primary entity, maybe through an affiliate or subsidiary. Um, but regardless, as that happens, one of the big trademark pitfalls that we see is clients not going back and amending their existing domestic and foreign registrations to reflect those new services. And that can be a big problem later down the road when you're trying to, to protect your, your, your mark and your registration. And to be clear, um, amending is, is the term of art. Uh, really, the, the, I think what Jeff is trying to say is that you should go and, and, and look to see whether you need to file new applications to cover um, you know, broader services. That's the key. You can always narrow a trademark application in terms of goods and services, but you can't make it broader after it's filed. So, before we leave this EU slide, just one more example. I want to make sure I hit it home for people. If you look at class 35 and class 41, there's a service everybody knows in this room and that is and on the webinar, and that is conference services. So in class 35 you have business conferences, and in class 41 you have educational conferences. Neither of those are articulated in the class heading. If you have the class heading in the EU for one of those classes and you really care about conferences, you're not covered if you meet all these criteria. You've got to go in before September 23rd and make a change. Okay, so moving on. Um, there's also a new uh, fee structure in the EU. And on you know, first blush, it looks like everything's fine, uh, but really they've just found another way to charge more money. Um, it, it, for many years, more than a decade, you could file a trademark application in the EU, cover all these countries and cover three classes really as we used to say for the price of one. And now they've decided that they want an a la carte system. Um, but in doing that, they're effectively making it so that if you want to cover three classes, you're going to pay more. You're basically going to get two classes for the same cost that you used to get three. Um, and so th there, there's a little bit of uh, a change there to be aware of still. Not, not as much to worry about. You'll hear about later how the Middle East has become very expensive. The EU is still the most cost-effective trademark uh, system in the world. Okay, so this is one of the most important topics for nonprofits is uh, certification, accreditation. You saw that Jeff uh, was noting a Venable presentation that's coming up about how to have uh, a, an appropriate uh, certification or accreditation program. And that will not focus on trademark aspects, but it's something um, to think about certainly for this audience. Um, what do we mean when we say certification? What do we mean, mean when we say accreditation or credential um, in, in the nonprofit world versus in the trademark world? How a court, how a trademark office, how an opposing counsel will view uh, that word. Um, there are very, very significant differences. This topic arises because of a change in EU law that will occur in October 2017. So about a year from now, you'll be able to register uh, certification marks. And so most nonprofits would say, terrific, let's go register all our certifications. Um, and most of, frankly, many of the uh, nonprofit trademark portfolios that we inherit that have older registrations cover certification marks in the U.S. So just by way of background, in the United States, uh, you can have a trademark or a service mark. Um, and a trademark is, is like Coca-Cola for, for Coke products, for goods. And a service mark is you know, what many nonprofits provide. It's a service, right? A conference service is a service. So that the mark that's used it, with it is a service mark. Um, there's something called a collective membership mark. If you have members, there's a mark that, uh, or a symbol that your chapters or your members may use simply to say we're a chapter or a member of this organization. That's a collective membership mark. Um, and that's something that, that you can protect in the U.S. as such, but not in most foreign countries under that name. The U.S. 
started recognizing, was one of the first years ago to recognize the concept of a certification mark. And what it meant was um, that, for example, with fair trade co coffee, if, if somebody uh, met certain standards for their coffee, they could put the fair trade uh, coffee logo. Uh, or the UL logo is another great example for uh, underwriters' laboratories. If your electrical device met certain standards, you could put uh, this UL logo on it. Um, so that really idea of a certification mark wasn't recognized in many foreign countries. And what's unique about it is it's not you, the nonprofit, using the brand or the, or the for-profit. Um, it's a third party. So with, that's the key background you need to know to understand why under trademark law what you're doing when you say certification is really not certification as a trademark lawyer or judge or USPTO will view it. What you really have is properly termed as accreditation. It's properly classified as a service mark because what you're doing is offering something more like a title or a degree or a credential to an individual to put after their name. Sure, it's a third party, it's not you, and they're, you know, the third party is using um, this credential, but they're not using it as a tra in an attention-getting manner as a brand to brand goods or services that they're providing. And so the example that I've put up there where it says XYZ TM services from Andrew Price, that's not what you're doing when you're awarding these credentials. You're encouraging them to say Andrew Price, comma, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, you, your credential holders are not going out and offering a service called X, Y, Z, the services from Andrew Price. So that's, that seems um, maybe like a mind-numbing distinction, but it is one of the great ways to register your brands properly in, in the U.S. and now in the EU um, and, and avoid one of the big traps that if, if you're in a dispute, opposing counsel will always raise this issue. And recently we got a letter uh, from a nonprofit who wanted us to look into a case from 2008 where there was some correspondence. And our client had written a demand letter itself without using counsel and said, we have a certification mark. And it's true that the client was able to obtain uh, on its own a certification registration in the U.S. So the other lawyer from a, a, a very uh, smart firm wrote back a big long letter that said, uh, you know, we agree and, uh, that you own this as a certification mark and we're not using it as a certification mark. But if you go on the Wayback Machine, which is an Internet archive, you can see that what our client was trying to say was, hey, you're using this as a credential, as an accreditation mark, and we're you, we have rights in it that way. The client would have had common law rights despite the, the misfiled application. Um, but basically because of a semantic game, our client filed the letter away and has now lost its ability now that we fast forward so many years later to go in and, and do anything about it. They're stopped under the law from it, taking action. Okay, so moving on um, to China. And Justin's going to have a lot to say here. Uh, Justin, how many times have you been to China? I lose count, probably about 40. Yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah, I had Mike turned off. So I lose count about 30 or 40 times at least. Okay. So um, Justin, uh, you have a lot of experience through your work with Sony. That Most of your trips were uh, there for Sony, but since you've been at Venable now for a number of years, you've probably been to China maybe five times or so? Sure. Ten? Okay. Okay. So everybody asks, including Jeff Tenenbaum, what about Michael Jordan in, in China? And everybody wants to talk either about Apple or Michael Jordan. They're not nonprofits, but, but this is, these are the, uh, the kind of horror stories. And so um, you know, China has a lot of horror stories. For our clients, we want to try to avoid the horror stories. Um, most, most people do, right? Everybody has good intentions in China. But the real problem is, who do you work with? How do you know from experience what to do? Um, we all know it matters, but you know, how much money do you throw at it? Do you know where to draw the line? Should you file in China? Should you really care? So I think it is important to look at um, the case of Michael Jordan first because people do want to talk about the horror stories. Um, so is China a slam dunk? We say ask Michael Jordan. Um, 
So he went up before the Supreme People's Court of China um, recently, and this made the news that his uh, retrial peti petitions were um, rejected. He was trying to cancel a third-party trademark for uh, the word Jordan in Chinese characters. So just in one sentence, we've identified so much about China. The court Supreme People's Court of China. We're going to talk more about how that court uh, and the forum that you're going to use has changed a little bit. Um, the idea of a petition to cancel. If you're a nonprofit doing anything with your brand in China, even if you've had success, you've been involved with these attempts to cancel somebody else's registration because um, th there are many people trying to steal your brand whether you know it or not in China and Chinese characters. So, you know, why do I have to protect my brand in Chinese characters? I, you know, I've got it in English, isn't that good enough? So, we'll talk about some of these different issues, but just to give you the procedure and, and some of the background, um, Michael first lost at what's called the TRAB, which is the Trademark Review and Adjudication Board. Um, he had a limited basis for appeal, and this is where the problems start. He had a certain forum he had to go to, which was the Supreme People's Court. He had a limited basis that, uh, of appeal that that court would accept. And on its face, it sounds like these are great you know, ways to win a case. You just say this had bad influence on society and it, it's deceptive or improper. It, that would seem to satisfy most people in this room and on the webinar. Um, but he failed because uh, they found, uh, the court found that there were no public interest uh, claims that he could use despite the fact that others had used that uh, as a basis before in the past. And I think everybody looks at China who's done IP work there to say, well, why are these decisions inconsistent? How come Michael Jordan couldn't rely on this basis when others have in the past? And you know, Justin will have comments on this as well, but China is very unpredictable. Um, it, it is a trial and error game in part, and the people who are doing the best, having the most success, have had more trial and error and are benefiting from that experience. But, um, so, so Michael ended up on the losing end here. He still has a case pending with the law firm that we use uh, in China, uh, one of the firms we use, and this argument is based on the fame of his name, and again, you'd think that that should be a successful um, avenue. But Part of the problem, we think, is the forum he had to use, and all that's changed. But Justin, first, do you have any other comments either on this or on Apple and the $60 million iPad? Sure, sure. So uh, in short, I think one of the big takeaways here, two takeaways for nonprofits is register early, register first. Uh, earlier, Andrew talked about the fact that many countries around the world have first-to-file systems, obviously when it comes to trademarks in the U.S., you can attain rights through use. In China, however, rights are attained and they're enforceable upon registration. So what happens with popular brands, whether it's a Michael Jordan, whether it's your nonprofit, and in particularly I see this being a problem and it's a trend. Andrew and I've talked about this for a number of associations and nonprofits where there is such a pressure in China to use things like credentialing and accreditation and marketing that whether people are doing it for purposes of a scam or whether it's a legitimate company that just likes your nonprofit's name and decides to file trademarks in it when you get popular in the U.S. but before you've come to China, that's something that I see a trend of and I see that happening to you know, companies all over the world and nonprofits. And so I think the other takeaway here is to look at whatever the Chinese equivalent of your nonprofit's name may be in China and whether that's a straightforward process because there are, you know, a unique acronym that you want to use, or if you want to go to the more expensive route of maybe hiring even Chinese consultants. Those are all successful steps that I've seen people do to prevent some of the gamesmanship that often happens to nonprofits whose names are targeted in China. This question in back. I'm finding that sometimes it's not enough to just simply register first and register early because that's what we did with our trademarks, and now we have someone that's coming behind us that, that filed to, for all of our trademarks in China, and now he's trying to invalidate our registrations. Uh, he wanted to set up shop in China and partner with us, and when we didn't want to partner with him, 
he then threatened us, and then now he's basically setting up our entire business model with our marks over in China. He's using it in China, and so now he's trying to cancel us out because we're not using it in China, but we have registrations. How old are your registrations? Uh, well, our U.S. brand is over 100 years old, but in China we got. Can you tell everyone what your uh, your brand is, if, you, if that's all right? Sure, actually, yeah. I'm assistant general counsel for the Better Business Bureau, Council of Better Business Bureau. So we have the BBB for accredited businesses and everything else. And in China, we registered in the what, early 2000s, I think. Yeah. So I mean, we so were there. That would be. Part of the challenge is China, and we talked about auditing and, and revisiting what you cover. Um, in China, a, you know, one hole that you would find in an audit is if you weren't using a brand in China um, for the last three years, if you had registrations, they're now all vulnerable. So you have kind of three years of insulation, um, but it's not that expensive to file in China. You'd simply, you know, refile every three years if it was a holding pattern uh, or a defensive uh, strategy. Right. So that situation you just described is something that's happened to a lot of, lot of organizations. And in that particular case, without diving into the specific of, of the case, I can tell you one of the most successful paths to go by when you're dealing with someone like that who was perhaps a business partner or a prospective business partner is to use bad faith. There's been a couple of changes in the Chinese trademark law over the past few years. And one of the most successful avenues that I've seen uh, U.S. and European uh, organizations and even nonprofits uh, use against someone in that type of scenario where you've got sort of a Chinese defendant who actually had knowledge of your business and knowledge of what you're doing, even if what they've done to sort of you know, spite you, predates you in China, if you can show through various research, and there's different ways to do this, that they were obviously knowing of your existence, maybe they've got contracts, maybe there's articles about the organization or the brand that predate what they're doing. There's a number of different factors that can be added into litigation in China uh, under the cause of bad faith. And that's often a way, and I would say in the past two or three years, I've been involved in maybe 15 different cases where we've successfully gone after uh, defendants or copycats or spurned business partners uh, who take on tactics like that. So that's certainly something to look at. That's a great segue to the new system in China and how you might take advantage of it. Justin and I will often ask each other, um, you know, in the morning, what are you working on? And we say China, and he'll say, oh, fun with China. Uh, and that's really what it is, fun with China. And so under the new system, the question is, is it more fun or less fun? Um, it's really more fun uh, and, and more success rates, I think, for uh, nonprofits and, and particularly non-Chinese entities. There are three new specialized IP courts in China. Um, essentially, what you're going to want as a trademark holder is, a, is the Beijing IP court. If you're a copyright holder, it's the Shanghai court. Um, but for the purposes of this trademark section, um, think uh, Beijing IP. Uh, they have more specialized judges. Uh, there's a quota on them, so like in the U.S., they're a little bit overworked, but um, the win rates appear to be better for foreign entities so far. There are dam actual damages coming out of these courts, and so and a little bit more transparency. Um, it's a new phenomenon, so we're talking about like you know 18 months or 12 months of real bona fide history to look at, but so far um, it's very positive uh, for uh, especially non-Chinese entities. Um, some of the factors with the Beijing IP court beyond what I mentioned, number one, this, this court has exclusive jurisdiction over any challenges to uh, these uh, trademark uh, appeal board decisions that we talked about earlier. So this is where you're going to go um, in cases, as Justin said, uh, of appeals involving bad faith registrations, which is really one of the key drivers. Um, but also first instance claims of well-known status. So if you, Justin can talk more about this, but it can be a very effective strategy to try to establish that your brand is well-known in China, and you can do it now by going directly to the Beijing IP court. This court has had 8,000 cases in its first year. Um, you know, as I said in the opening slide but didn't mention, um, Litigation is just booming in China in part through because of this court. Its trademark litigation is down in the U.S., but this is where all the action is. 
Forty percent of the caseload of this court involves a foreign party. Um, and so now you can start to see if you're a nonprofit who's thinking, well, we, yeah, I think we care about China. Through some of these stories and maybe this slide, you can see China's real. If you're ignoring uh, this country from a trademark law point of view, if you have any interest in China, if you have any prospect there, now is the time uh, to deal with your rights. Justin. I would agree with that totally. And despite one of the biggest myths that I often hear from organizations and nonprofits, uh, the myth being, you know, China's too big for me to tackle. It's too expensive. Isn't everyone over there, you know, going to put me through sort of a kangaroo court system? Why should I throw money into a black hole? That was part of the history, I think. I'd say probably in the past five to ten years, however, companies, organizations, nonprofits, celebrities, you know, there are many different stars who actually have had a better uh, turnout or outcome than even Michael Jordan. The theme and the consistent thing that they've all done, though, was take some of this advice and some of the things that you're hearing today to heart and integrate that, that in their outreach strategy. So the early registration, forum shopping, looking at the right courts, and in situations where you are dealing with business partners right when you're in the point of expanding, or let's say in the nonprofit world, you've got new members or new affiliates or new chapters, being very meticulous and careful about documenting what you're doing can go a long way if things turn into litigation or some sort of dispute later. So nonprofits uh, and, and for-profit entities today are, are not choosing the, to, to buy into the extortion uh, solution uh, or the, the solution of paying parties who are trying to extort them as, as the solution because of this, quote, kangaroo court, the chances are greater that you're going to get a real hearing um, in China. You know, it was just five or six years ago or so that Apple paid $60 million for iPad for one registration. On paper, it had the right chain of title. It was the owner on paper. But there was a filing a few hundred dollar filing that was missing in this first to file jurisdiction of China. And without that piece of paper on file, Apple was right. given the choice of paying $60 million to a party that was extorting it. Unproven, but, but uh, you know, uh, on, on its face, that, that's the way it may appear. And, and decided uh, to just buy its way out of the, the problem. That's not happening as much today, but it does show that the Chinese system requires that you just work the system, file what you need to file, uh, and, and try to do it proactively, not retroactively. Um, and I don't mean to throw a monkey wrench into uh, your nonprofit's analysis on what to do regarding China, but many of you are, are familiar with this new law that the uh, Chinese legislature passed and was signed into law in, in April of this past year that's slotted to take effect next year um, that gives uh, the Chinese government kind of broad police authority over regulating nonprofits in China. That has caused a lot of consternation and concern. We've been counseling dozens of our nonprofit clients who are kind of reevaluating their China strategy, concerned about risk. There's uh, probably many more unanswered questions than there are answered ones right now. Um, it's something that we have been closely covering, uh, and if you sign up for our, our mailing list and you see our alerts, uh, you, you've seen some stuff on that and you will see more as we get more information, but it is something to keep a close eye on. Okay, so what do we know from our personal experience with the Beijing IP court so far? Um, it's taking longer than expected. Uh, it's costing more than expected. Um, and this is, this is even, you know, based on uh, time projections and cost estimates from, uh, you know, the firm that's handling the Michael Jack, uh, Jordan case. Um, part of this is because we've realized that the Beijing IP court, like many other courts, even though it's new and better, it's still got to be pushed on things like you know, publishing the notice of a hearing and things like this, some of these administrative matters, because they're understaffed. And so um, we've seen that as a pitfall. Um, it's generally been the case then that when you get a budget for China um, from local council that, that you have to kind of build in. Uh, that, w that it will likely increase, and that's been our experience. Um, and Justin has a strategy that we've used uh, together, but he's been really the, the one interfacing with the U.S. IP attache in China. Right. Just a couple of words on that, because I know time is uh, running out here. But in light of Andrew's comments and Jeff's earlier about just some of the legislative changes there in China and how there's more active regulation 
of nonprofits forcing, I think, a lot of management of nonprofit to assess risk, you know, whether you want to operate there or are costs going up. One great asset that I often find underutilized by nonprofits and by for-profit companies alike is taking advantage of the U.S. State Department's subgroup of people who are at embassies in major economies around the world who handle business and IP issues. In China, there's actually a pretty substantial office of people there who work under the U.S. IP attache. They're in the U.S. Embassy. And what they do is they interface with various Chinese government and regulatory officials on behalf of U.S. companies, particularly if stories like these are brought to them and they see certain trends. I've been involved in a number of cases or instances where we've been able to bring a number of different you know, war stories to IP attaches, and particularly in China, and they're able to orchestrate either formal or informal meetings with different officials in China that in many cases will influence or at least educate uh, decision makers who have a hand in making that outcome uh, and making that decision that would impact your nonprofit. Justin, is this more like a safety measure to ensure a fair outcome? That's a good question. I think it could be sort of a dual role. At, at a minimum, it's certainly a safety measure. I think over time, to the extent you have the time, the wherewithal, and the resources, like I said, the USIP attaches are underutilized. They're often looking for opportunities or ways to get themselves involved on behalf of U.S. organizations of any type. So if you're finding yourself in your organization in the midst of sort of repeat or systematic problems that you feel, feel free to reach out to us or there's different ways to do it to the U.S. government to bring it to their attention. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many times they actually will be excited uh, on your behalf um, as, you know, a U.S. entity to uh, try to affect the outcome positively for you, particularly if you feel like litigation is going on south and it's for some unfair reason. Okay, very good. Now I'm going to race through uh, some of these slides to keep everybody awake. Um, to finish up China and a few of these other countries as we move into copyright. So Alibaba, you might have heard, is offering, as of a few months ago, a way to file, quote, free or low-cost trademark applications. And there's been a lot of talk about this and why it occurred. I, I know Justin could probably talk about Alibaba and other China issues for, for an hour, but if we were just to sum it up very briefly, um, I think from my point of view, the question, there are really two issues here. One is, is this really just another tool for bad faith trademark filers? Um, and, and probably the answer is that it's going to be used by a lot of bad faith trademark filers. Um, and, and the other part of it is maybe, why did Alibaba do this? And you know, Justin could speak to it, but on its face it would appear that they're trying to counteract the impression that they're uh, sites are just used for counterfeiting and that they actually are now on the side of protecting IP. So that, that may be a reason. Another thing to consider um, as part of all this is, is local legal advice really needed to file a trademark application? It's kind of the age-old question, do you need a trademark lawyer? Um, but I think you see from the stories already that that's going to be the least of your <laughs> concerns and probably the most well-spent money in China is to get local advice and representation. Justin, anything to add? Yeah, I would agree with that. To the extent uh, uh, you all are not familiar with Alibaba, just a quick word on that. Alibaba is very big compared to sort of an eBay or Amazon. Um, everything in China, when you compare it to the U.S., oftentimes is, is scales bigger. But it's basically a very popular e-commerce platform. Uh, and the company owns and operates a number of different e-commerce e platforms. Most popularly, they're known for offering different sites that allow for business-to-business -business sales. A lot of people, including even in the U.S., will buy things that are, are internationally sourced from China. Alibaba, as a company, is oftentimes accused of being on the side or at least protecting or giving some cover to uh, uh, unscrupulous merchants who may be selling fakes. Uh, they do a lot of things themselves to try to police that, but nonetheless, this move, it's, it's really been commented on quite a bit to offer or at least investigate doing trademark filings was something I think that would help repair their image in that way. Okay, so a couple of things to watch and watch out for in China very quickly. One is a thing to watch is this new database that you might have heard of uh, that the Chinese Trademark Office just established in the last month. Um, it's a database of contact persons of foreign trademark owners. 
basically we're watching this to see what it's all about. There was a July 20th deadline that came out of nowhere um, that everybody was informed about like a week beforehand. Um, you know, I'm speaking of the big um, uh, firms in China. So we're trying to, to figure out where this is going, but this looks like something that would be a positive for nonprofits uh, going forward, but we're watching. Another thing to watch out for, of course, we heard a little bit about it earlier, is if you have any dealings with another party in China and are talking about a joint venture, uh, a couple points. One is file your trademark before you start talking, because if you don't do it, they're going to do it for leverage. Number two, never enter, enter into a joint ownership arrangement with any party anywhere in the world unless you don't have to. Uh, they're fraught with, with problems and, and uh, things to watch out for. So. Um, moving on, Cuba. This is a pretty simple update. Uh, so recipe for a Cuba Libra, which sounds good right about now uh, for sure in the heat of August. Um, so the question is, you know, Cuba Libra is, is Coke. Uh, uh, for me, Captain Morgan and Lime, whatever your, your pleasure. Um, but it's a rum and Coke, basically. So, so what's the recipe for it? Do you have to use Coca-Cola? Can, you know, who's going to own that brand? Well, that's, that's the question. Now Cuba's basically open. It does matter. Uh, it may matter a little less for your average nonprofit, but it is a hot topic. The ABA uh, it just featured it on the cover of their IP magazine and, and are doing a, a presentation on that subject. Um, the, the, the issue here is what are the well-known brand uh, owners doing? They're always the leading indicators, and they're going into Cuba. How do you get in the door? This is the challenge. Uh, you've got to be represented by a local agent. You have to have a way in to get to that agent. So if you have uh, a need, if you think your, your nonprofit has interest in Cuba or you're a well enough known brand um, globally, something you can talk to us about, we have a mechanism to get you in the door. Um, in the Middle East, costs just went up again. Uh, this is the most expensive region in the world to register a trademark. If you've got to cross something off your list for budgetary reasons, um, you know, you're going to probably cross off every country except the UAE, generally speaking. Um, the UAE, if you've already filed, great. Um, the cost just went up if you want to file new applications. So it's, it's very expensive, unfortunately, and I think the cost will keep going up there. Uh, outside of the Middle East, there's development in Canada to know about that they have made uh, classification now voluntary. It's been that way for a little while. It's going to become mandatory in a, a couple years. Classification is very important for uh, deterrence purposes, so we recommend uh, identifying your classes to the Canadian Trademark Office. We talked about classes earlier under the EU. Um, so we talked about also the, the basics. They're always going to be the same in times of change. And now I want to turn it over to Justin for uh, copyright. Great. Okay, as we shift into copyright, copyright in contrast to trademarks, where trademarks protect things like brands, logos, names, the way you uh, leave your mark on consumers or members of your organization in the, in the market. Copyright, on the other hand, protects content. Sometimes you've also heard the term content is king. I think for nonprofits, copyrights are also extremely important. While the brand is an asset that's extremely valuable, and it particularly is something that is uh, something that every company and organization and nonprofit struggles to keep in, in pristine condition and it's associated with your reputation, at the end of the day, from an operational standpoint, if you think about it, it's your content, it's your materials. And as you can see here on this particular slide, I think some of the more uh, real examples in terms of publications, educational handbooks, training materials, staff manuals, uh, promotional materials, artwork, and photographs and imagery are the types of things that nonprofit organizations deal with every day uh, in terms of giving information to their members, the staff, uh, in many cases, it's the type of thing that you're also selling or offering uh, for sale through the organization as well. So it's important to have a handle on the copyright for that material. Earlier today, you heard Jeff uh, talk about sort of the relative cost of, of in comparing sort of filing and the complexity for filing trademarks versus copyrights. I think in all of our opinion, I think it's more simple 
to file for uh, copyright application. In many cases, our firm, a small group within our firm, works with nonprofits exclusively to try to walk you through how to file copyright applications. They're still extremely important to file in the U.S. and in certain other jurisdictions for certain reasons, but on the application side, you often find the costs very low. For example, in the U.S., I think you're talking about a $45 filing fee. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind in copyrights, while registration is very important, and for lots of reasons we don't have time to get into today, there are, there are notable benefits to registration. Um, in the nonprofit sector, there are other things that are equally important to do to secure your rights. Using copyright notices is important. Um, uh, as the slide says, for employees that are creating works within the scope of employment, the copyright automatically vests in the employer, and the nonprofit employer is owned by the employer. But for anyone else who's not an employee, a paid independent contractor, unpaid volunteers, um, committee members, board members, speakers, authors, all of which are very common in the nonprofit world and create lots of invaluable copyrightable content that the nonprofit then later uses to carry out its mission and purpose and make money and do other things and repurpose. It's critically important that you secure the rights from those individuals through either copyright assignment or licensing, uh, the form which has to be in writing to be valid. And so having good forms in place for you, with your volunteers, your speakers and authors, making sure you have good copyright assignment language in your contracts with your independent contractors and consultants and whatnot is critically important to protecting your rights. And then just like in trademarks, on the flip side, when you're letting others use your copyrightable material, and in the nonprofit sector, that happens even more than in a for-profit world because you, your content, you want to push it out there, educational content, research, white papers, other things like that. That's how you, in some ways, how you carry out some of your mission and purpose. You want to make sure that while you may be <clears throat> putting it out there for broad use, you don't want to jeopardize your rights in it. And so putting clear terms and, and uh, limitations on the, the scope of a license that you might be providing to others to use your copyrighted material is very important as well. Now, those are key points. Uh, it's very important in practical terms to have agreements to cover these types of things. Copyrights come into existence without necessarily having to be registered, and that's a point that I can't underscore enough. And if you see on this next slide, we talked earlier about you know, the differences between using the circle R and TM. Oftentimes, if you look in publications or on the web, when you attach a notice to say something is copyrighted to the world, you have that little C with a circle around it. Your copyrights start from the moment that that work or that publication is created whether it's registered or not. And that's a general rule around the world. Registration is important, however, if you're trying to get damages from certain people in certain country, countries or if you're trying to sue in a federal court. So let's talk about a few international developments here that impact uh, copyright. We talked about China earlier. Uh, what's interesting with copyrights, before we dive into all the specific countries here, is that there really are not as many different developments country specific uh, for copyrights, much because when it comes to copyrights in, in the recent, uh, uh, I would say, age that we all live in, in digital age, I think it's almost intuitive to many people that digital rights are, are key. They've become sort of the lifeblood of everyone from nonprofits to even how we all entertain ourselves through movie and art forms and things like that. It is almost without uh, fail that Everyone from big companies to even some of the rights collection societies all sort of have their hands in how people will monetize and collect uh, money that comes from copyrights. And so what you see in reverse there is a lot less development in terms of legislative developments from different countries when it comes to copyright, just sort of an aside. In China, two big developments here. One, and I think probably is very significant in the past year here, is this recent State Copyright Administration announcement that they are going to have a regulation, and they use this long term here, uh, and I'll shorten this up, but basically regulating network disk services. That's a fancy way of just saying those who are using cloud storage services. That's important because a lot of organizations and nonprofits in particular, and we're seeing this now, many of you are probably experiencing this, will have content hosted in some way through a cloud service. In the U.S., when you have copyright infringement and people are taking data or taking works off, let's say, a database or a cloud accessible site, we here often use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to apply to whoever's hosting that service and how you deal with people who are infringing. In China, there really was nothing that was identical to that, and this basically fills that gap. 
It allows those who are hosting these digital services a safe harbor from protection if within a certain amount, in this case 24 hours, they remove infringing files, otherwise face liability, but it doesn't stymie people who are coming up with sort of useful online databases or taking a lot of content and putting it onto the cloud for others to access. The other development, and it really has more to do with just China coming online and trying to harmonize its laws and do a bit better job in terms of even, I think, repairing its image when it comes to copyrights internationally, is they have uh, sort of a patchwork of different uh, bureaucracies within China. Uh, the National Copyright Administration is really sort of the key agency there, but they've established this alliance uh, last fall um, that's been focused a little bit more between all the bureaucracy to sort of unify it and make sure they're putting out more consistent rules and regulations when it comes to the issues of creation, use, and protection of, of content. In Europe, Europe is uh, actually very interesting in a couple of ways. In Europe, unlike the U.S., there is no uh, registration scheme. Now, while there's no registration scheme or office dedicated to taking in your copyright applications like there is in the U.S., copyright issues are often hard fought there for a couple of reasons. The copyright collection societies there are very active, particularly on the audiovisual side. But also because there is not a registration scheme, companies, organizations, nonprofits often have to settle their disputes in a much more public fashion when they do fight. And there often are fights over when something was published or when something was created. Our second bullet there is interesting. I put registration is important. Obviously, it's not required in, in the EU or in Europe. But I can't tell you enough times where one of the key pieces of evidence is an international organization pulling out copyright registrations that it has made in the U.S. or China to make certain points while they're in the midst of a dispute in Europe. The other point there where we've got the italicized CEU Copyright Office, that relates to another trend that we're seeing more of. And I don't know how familiar you, are, all, you all are with this. You see it recently more on the trademark side, but a lot of people will get these, particularly companies, will get these official mailers from organizations or entities that appear to look as if they are, uh, you know, the U.S. Trademark Service Incorporated, and they've got information because they've gone to public databases with your, you know, trademark numbers. This is happening quite a bit in Europe, but there you've got different private companies that will call themselves the EU Copyright Office. There's no EU Copyright Office. You've heard earlier from Andrew here about the EU Intellectual Property Office, but there is not an office there that will officially take your application and register it for copyright protection. So just a quick snippet for everybody to remember. Last but not least on the third bullet is that one area that is sort of on the cutting edge in Europe when it comes to copyrights is that there more than anywhere else we're seeing that ISPs, internet service providers, uh, that would be the equivalents of like your Verizons and AT&Ts here, are actually being held liable for infringement on that network. And what that means is that in cases where a plaintiff or rights holder can prove that they have sent a number of takedown notices or a number of complaint letters to a particular target or a particular defendant or entity who is copying their content, white papers, publications, and they have not received the kind of responsiveness they're looking for from that organization or the hosting organization, whoever that telecom provider is, like the AT&T or Verizon there, the courts have been much more aggressive about holding whoever that ISP or host is for the copyright that's happening on their network or copyright infringement happening on their network. So that's just food for thought for those of you all, whoever may find yourselves in a situation where you're trying to enforce uh, your copyrights in Europe. And, and it's also important that you may not think of your nonprofit as an ISP, but a lot of nonprofits, especially uh, we see it a lot in the trade and professional association community, um, are frequent hosts of forums where 
members and others can post information, including copyrightable content. Uh, so we've dealt with this situation for years. There is some limited federal protection from defamation liability for uh, nonprofits in the U.S. that serve that function, where it's not your staff or your paid contractors who are writing the content, but it's your volunteer members and others who are posting it. There is some protection for defamation liability. There really is no protection under that statute for um, copyright and trademark infringement or antitrust liability. And, and as such, uh, both in the U.S. and in, in, in Europe, it's important that when you're serving that function, well, you may not be screening all of the content, and hopefully you are at least getting the posters to click and accept that they, they warrant and represent that it doesn't infringe anyone else's copyrights, trademarks, defame anyone, invade anyone's privacy, etc. Um, that when you do get takedown notices uh, and, and you get alerted that something may infringe someone else's rights, that you take it down right away. Right. Absolutely. One other point with that, and I think it goes to what Jeff was talking about. Also, for those of you who are hosting and acting as an ISV or hosting content, make sure that in your terms of services, particularly for your users or staff who may be uploading things, that you specifically have language in there that talks about uh, or at least prohibits uh, people uploading things that they know to be or could be found to be infringing, and make sure you reserve all the rights for yourselves or for your own nonprofit giving yourself full and sole discretion to determine what should and should not be posted so that you can take it down without a fight. If you are looking at one of these short time windows where someone's written you a letter or two and you need to take it down before they go to the next level, which would be litigation. And of course, also in addition to that, make sure that you're getting a broad, even if it's a non-exclusive license, a broad right to use that content in any way that you want in the future without having to get permission. Nonprofits you know, have a long and great history of taking that content and repurposing it, repackaging it, and you want to make sure you have the royalty-free, unlimited rights to use that content worldwide for any purpose that you want. Right. Uh, Justin, we're just about out of time. Any, uh, any final high notes that you want to hit? Yeah, maybe go to that last slide on uh, best copyright practices for nonprofits. Right. I'm going to leave you with this last slide here. We'll leave you this last slide here. Just a couple of takeaways for best practices. We've talked a lot about today about the value of, of registration, uh, at least in jurisdictions where you can. It'll certainly make things easier for you when it comes to enforcement. Uh, number two, you've also heard this theme today. Make sure you have clear agreements, whether it's with your employees, staff, independent contractors, or with someone uploading content to your site that you may then be promulgating to other users or people in your organization. And then last but not least, I think monitor sort of key areas uh, or regions that you are concerned about, at least areas that may be of growth for, in terms of membership, because as we've talked about today, whether it's Brexit, some of the changes in China, changes in Cuba, something always happens to companies and organizations after that change. There's the quick and the dead, as you, as you probably heard that quote out there. Many people who are quick and infringing are very astute, and particularly in China as an example, of these law changes and will use it to your disadvantage. And so in both the copyright and the trademark area, so many of our nonprofit clients that are very sophisticated in the intellectual property area have a very regular and aggressive program of monitoring and policing use of their marks. It's critically important to do. There's lots of different ways to do it. There's some cost-effective ways to do it. But you have to be very vigilant, not just in the U.S., but obviously we're seeing around the world, even in countries in where you may not be operating or not operating yet, you have to be vigilant in that regard. And then the final point I, I would make here is that one thing that we've seen a lot where U.S.-based nonprofits are, are entering into activities and partnerships and relationships in foreign countries, they often will team up with existing nonprofit and or for-profit companies or organizations on the ground in those countries. In these situations, all the issues we're talking about here today, copyright and trademark, become more complicated because you have two or more parties that are using perhaps the same marks, one licensing their marks to the other, licensing copyrighted material to the other, maybe cr jointly creating new marks, new copyrighted material together. And it's very, very important that you well define those relationships. You spell out in writing contractually who has what rights uh, to do what while that relationship exists. And obviously most, sometimes I think most importantly, you got to have a good prenup in there. You got to plan for the divorce. You got to plan for the time when you're no longer working together. Who's going to have the rights to use uh, those trademarks and those copyrighted materials? Who has the rights to register and what name, et cetera, et cetera? Critically, critically important to focus on. Um, with that, on the uh, on the last slide there, Justin, there's links there to all of our online resources. We have a lot of great material 
on uh, articles, PowerPoint presentations, and recorded webinars on copyright and trademark issues. Also in your handout book there's some. And in the email you'll get tomorrow we'll include links to the prior recorded webinars that we've done on uh, copyright and trademark issues. Andrew has been a part of most of those. Uh, Justin and Andrew, great job. Thank you all for participating. Enjoy the rest of the summer, and we hope to see you back here in September. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.